good afternoon. Today's omnibus is given over to a famous play which contains the favorite dramatic role of a distinguished actor. The play is Oliver Goldsmith's She Stoops to Conquer. The role is that of young Marlowe, and the actor is Michael Redgrave. Now, Mr. Redgrave came to this country in the fall to repeat the enormous success he had in London with the uh, Girardou Christopher Fry play about the Trojan War, Tiger at the Gates. But today it's She Stoops to Conquer and Goldsmith. I suppose that Goldsmith is one of those guilty, shadowy relics of our school days. How's it go? He uh, wrote The Vicar of Wakefield, he knew Dr. Samuel Johnson, and he was such a total flop at conversation that uh, the actor David Garrick said about him, he writes like an angel and he talks like poor Paul. Oh, and yes, uh, in a rather flattering portrait by Reynolds, he looked like this. But, in point of fact, he was one of the most engaging and pathetic ne'er-do-wells in the history of literature. He was born in Ireland in 1728, and he was born poor. He was the son of a minister who had to earn his family's food by farming it. Now, I won't bore you with the record of the uh, boyhood and youth of Goldsmith. It was so awful. He was at the bottom of every class. He tried and failed to work his way through college. He was dismissed in turn, fired would be a better word, as a domestic servant, as a druggist assistant, as a hospital orderly. Maybe we'd better just say that he gave a new meaning to the phrase, an unpromising boy. For several years, he was an actual beggar all over Europe. He used to play a flute outside convent gates. But in London, they didn't have any convents. So, back in London, he uh, resumed his squalor almost as a natural element. And he wound up uh, working as a hack for mean publishers. He wrote a simple and inaccurate history of England. He wrote a grotesque encyclopedia about animals. Dr. Johnson said if he can tell a cow from a horse, that is the extent of his knowledge of zoology. But there came a day when he wrote some small pieces about London life. And they were written with such purity and simpleness that he came to the attention of very important people. And they bullied him into writing and putting on, in 1773, She Stoops to Conquer. Or, it was called, The Mistakes of a Night. It was a straight farce, the first in the 18th century about a young man who stammered almost as much as Goldsmith. And this play killed in a night the fashion for sentimental romances. Now, with the proceeds of this play, he was able to live in comfort. So, he lived in opulence and died deep in debt, trying to cure himself of a disease he didn't have. Oh, by the way, he, at one point, he was such a burden to his friends that they subscribed 30 pounds to ship him to America. And he got to Cork, all right, and he sold his horse, and he paid for his passage. But he was always a man for a last-minute party. And when he woke up, the boat had sailed. If he'd caught it, we might have been burdened with his immortality. So this is the man whose undying farce you are going to see today, Oliver Goldsmith. Now we shall have a message from our first subscriber, and then be back to introduce Michael Redgrave, and Hermione Gingold in She Stoops to Conquer. Now, She Stoops to Conquer uh, is a comedy of courtship, but it was written in 1773, and we ought to say something about the difference in the conventions of courtship and marriage. In the 18th century, a young man didn't just come home and say, surprise, surprise, Dad, I'm married. On the contrary, in the 18th century, it was the father who called in the young gentleman. Charles, my son? Yes, Father? Uh, be seated, my boy, be seated. Uh, you've heard me speak of my old friend Hardcastle of Slough in the Mire in Surrey, I think. Yes, Father. Uh, he has a marriageable daughter. Uh, yes, Father? The uh, girl comes unto a thousand a year, so the match is not without its uh, advantages. 
Yes, but... I desire, therefore, that you may take post horses tomorrow morning and journey into Surrey. But, Father... I've written to Hardcastle. He will expect you. But, Father, you know how devilishly awkward and timid I am among the ladies, and I, I feel... Sir, timid, sir. <laughs> Gad, so you should be. Hardcastle can't bear a swaggerer. Well, well, he, he's informed of your timidity. He knows what wares to expect. Yes, but, Father... Enough. Uh... Off you go, lad. Off you go. Yes, Father. Of course, a shy lad wouldn't go by himself on such an errand. He would, like Miles Standish, enlist the support of his friend. In this case... George Hastings. You desire me to drive into Surrey with you to defend you from the lady you're commanded to woo. Would you be so good, George? I shall stand in devilish need of support. Oh, my dear Charles, I come with you with pleasure. The more so as Miss Neville, who is never far from my thoughts, is huh? staying in Surrey with her aunt, Mrs. Hardcastle. Uh, and if there is time... Just one moment, George. Did you say Mrs. Hardcastle? Yes, Charles. My Constance's aunt and guardian, Mrs. This, Hardcastle. It's to this very Mr. Hardcastle's house that we're going. To Hardcastle's house? Uh-huh. A miracle. A miracle? Oh, we shall kill two birds with one stone, huh? <laughs> <laughs> As for the girl in the case, Kate Hardcastle. To be plain with you, Kate, I expect the young gentleman I have chosen for you to arrive this very day from town. I have his father's letter here. Bless me, how shall I behave? It's a thousand to one I shan't like him. I'm told he's of excellent understanding. Is he? Very generous. I believe I shall like him. Young and brave. I'm sure I shall like him. And very handsome. My dear papa, say no more. He's mine. I'll have him. Then there's the young lady's friend, Constance Neville. The son of Sir Charles Marlowe. You know him, Constance. But he's a most intimate friend of my Mara and Mr. Hastings. Oh. oh, you must have seen them together when we lived in town. No. But how goes your affair with dear Mr. Hastings? Okay. Kate, my mother has been courting you, I wager, for my brother Tony. Oh, Kate, night and day. <laughs> night and day. <laughs> and the girl's parents, Squire and Mrs. Hardcastle. <sighs> Mrs. Hardcastle, I have always loved old things. Old friends, old manners, old times, old books and old wine. And, Dorothy, I think you'll own I've been pretty fond of an old wife. Oh, Lord, Mr. Hardcastle, I'm not so old as you'd make me by more than one good year. Oh. Why, I was but 20 when I was to bed of Tony, mm -hmm. and he's not come to years of discretion yet. No, never will I dare answer. Why, school would be his death. You know he's delicate. As a stallion, and about as tractable. Such a dear, tender, shy, retiring angel. <laughs> Your son, Mrs. Hardcastle, is a mere composition of tricks and mischief. No matter, Mr. Hardcastle. I'll soon have him married to Constance, my niece. <laughs> and I'll soon have our Kate married to my old friend Marlowe's son. And together they shall breed up a whole new family.